Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our Maple Ridge Ag Advisory Committee presentation um, with uh, Paul Van Westendorp uh, speaking on the issue of pollinators. Uh, my name is Bill Hardy. I'm the current chair of the Maple Ridge Agriculture Advisory Committee. And this is the first in a series that we'll be doing um, to uh, educate the, the general public and the population here in Maple Ridge about some of the agricultural issues that we we, uh, we find important. So you can watch for more of these to, to be coming. Uh, we'll probably do another one in, in the fall, early fall, September or October-ish, and uh, keep your eyes open for those. Um, if you have any questions during the course of the uh, presentation, you can either put them in the chat window. If we have time afterwards, we can uh, um, ask Paul directly. Um, alternatively, um, if we get questions after the fact, um, uh, you can reach us through the uh, email at the Maple Ridge Ag Advisory Committee and uh, we will get some answers for you. So we're also looking for any suggested topics for the future, so uh, keep that in mind as well. In the meantime, I'm going to um, turn it over to Paul to lead us through the presentation. It's all yours now, Paul. Great. Well, well thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, to, tonight, then, we will be talking about pollinators, bees and pollinators and everything associated with that. And some people uh, uh, may wonder from, well, why would that be a topic of discussion? Well, I hope that I can convince you with uh, the importance of pollinators in our environment and uh, the critical role that they play in uh, sustaining environments uh, and the problems that we face if we do not have pollinators. And it is important to, uh, if you look at the subtitle, to keep that in mind, that the, all these magical events that take place in pollination has to do with the fact that you have a very divergent group of organisms, plants and insects primarily, that have co-evolved over millions of years uh, to meet each other's uh, reproductive needs and dietary needs. And, uh, and it is not something that is just automatic. This has evolved over many millions of years. So uh, Bill was referring earlier to uh, being an educational uh, evening. Well, you will get basic biology lesson uh, number one when it comes to pollinators. So uh, let's start. Um, oops, I am not moving this thing here. Before the flowering plants uh, developed in uh, on the world, um, uh, the environment was a pretty dull place. Uh, the, at the time of the dinosaurs and even before that, uh, much of the plant uh, cover uh, on the earth was fairly uh, uh, restricted or characterized by ferns and plants that had very simple reproductive strategies. And those were often using spores or vegetatively so that they could just simply start up an, another plant with a root that would uh, travel through the soil and eventually shoot out another other, other uh, uh, new plant kind of thing. Uh, very primitive, very simple. Uh, as a result, uh, the, uh, the environment was, compared to in today's terms, uh, rather low in biodiversity. There were only a number of predominant uh, creatures in there, and uh, um, uh, it, it was altogether quite limited. And also, because of the limited biodiversity, you also had a very slow rate of uh, adaptation uh, to climatic changes or certain events such as floods or storms or whatever. So it was, an, it was a dull environment. And then about 95 million years ago, the flowering plants started to develop. And the first flowering plants, uh, the, 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 what sets them apart from the previous ones was that they, they started to develop flowering flower parts, body parts, that were either gender specific, they were either female or male, and they, uh, they were, uh, or sometimes different plants uh, were specific in their gender, um, and, and therefore you started to get uh, plants the ability to do crossbreeding, and there was a greater form of hybridization of genetic material. And that led to a much greater level of, of biodiversity. But in order to make that all work, uh, the plants had to uh, uh, establish relations, if you will, with external agents that could facilitate this transfer of gene material from one plant or from one flower to another one. 
uh, of course, as you know, plants have the, the misfortune of being stuck in the ground and they cannot just walk over, have a little bit of fun and then walk back again. So they need an external agent. Okay. And it was this correlation that started to take place between these agents and the plants that developed a great degree of interdependency between these organisms and a window of opportunity for much greater biodiversity. And we can really speak here of a, of a revolutionary event that took place about 95 million years ago with the onset of flowering plants. Here's a schematic uh, presentation as to what actually happens in pollination. And here at the top, you will see an, an, a flower with its various parts. And here you have in the center of the ovules inside that are basically the female eggs and inside of this ovary uh, and this long uh, tubular vessel with on the top of it, you have a stigma and a very sticky service that uh, uh, is very attractive for, uh, for pollen grains to fall on. And as soon as a pollen grain that you can see here on the right side, that comes from the male flower parts, which are stamens, uh, uh, that, that pollen grain is then basically stuck onto this, this stigma and it develops a tube that goes along the style and goes into the ovary and tries to hit one of these ovules or these eggs. And then you have essentially fertilization taking place. And that is what you can see here at the bottom. Um, and on the left side, you have the female flower parts. There you have, of course, the ovary with these ovules inside of it. Okay. And that results in a fertilized egg or a fertilized ovule. And that permits the plant to uh, commit resources, uh, food resources, uh, to, uh, to develop this fruit or this nut uh, seed uh, in order to secure its reproductive uh, uh, opportunities. Okay. So the flowers or the, the plants developed two strategies. One of them was the flowering plants. One of them was to uh, uh, depend on external forces in the form of wind and water and things like this. And we call that abiotic pollination. And the wind, of course, is a good example. And uh, the evergreens and all the grasses and the grains are typically falling into this group. It is mostly in environments with relatively low biodiversity, and I'm thinking here about the prairies, for example, uh, or the pampas of, uh, of uh, Argentina and those, where you have the grasses dominate the landscape with a relatively few species. And when these pollen grains are aloft in the wind, uh, there is a high percentage of them that will eventually get stuck onto a, a female flower part and ensure its pollination. Okay, and that is then again, it is somewhat by chance because it depends on the way how the wind goes. And the evergreens is also a good example uh, where you sometimes have clouds of, of yellow pollen that are uh, whiffing through the, through the air. And uh, many of them are wasted because they end up on your car or in the pond or in the river or wherever they are, but hardly any of them will ever end up onto the female flower part. And because there is such a wastage involved, the plant can simply not commit many food resources into each of those pollen grains. So by definition, wind pollinated plants have a very low nutritional value to outside, you know, to pollinators like bees or others. Uh, they are not very interesting for, as a food source, okay? However, when we go into uh, uh, the, the, the biotic pollination, we are talking about external agents that participate in the transfer of pollen from the male flower to the female flower. Okay. And in most of those cases, when that happens successfully, here you have a good photograph of the, uh, the, uh, the pollens here on the stamens. And here you have right in the middle, this lovely stigma and a very sticky surface. And of course, the trick is that uh, the pollen grains will go in there and then will descend down into the ovary or through the style into the ovary and to uh, find an egg or an ovule. 
Now, the question that a lot of people would say from, oh, hold on for a second. If you have here this sticky stigma, you have these pollen grains, that is pretty futile. I mean, these pollen grains can just be dumped right on here. Now, the plants have developed all kinds of strategies to prevent inbreeding. So, for example, the pollen grains of this particular flower may simply not be accepted by the female flower uh, to, 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 to fertilize an ovule. Other strategies include that sometimes plants will first flower all the female flower parts in the hope that there is somewhere else another plant that releases its pollen grains and vice versa, that the pollen grains become available, but the female uh, parts of that tree or that flower is simply not ready for uh, receiving any pollen grains. So there are various strategies that plants have developed to reduce inbreeding. Okay. The result of this, however, is with these external agents, and I will talk about this shortly, uh, you have a very efficient and directed process of transfer of pollen grains from one flower to another or from one plant to another plant. Okay. And that eventually leads to an enormous amount of specialization of both these external agent as well as the plant. The relationship between a pollinator and a plant can be very, very um, uh, specialized. And I will refer to that a bit later. Um, and it also allowed for this enormous expansion in biodiversity in many habitats throughout the world. It comes for, with a price, and the price is a high level of interdependency. You take one of them away, let's say if you take that insect away or this pollinator, whatever that may be, uh, maybe that flower cannot be pollinated by any other organism and therefore it will be doomed uh, into extinction. And there are quite a few examples that has happened uh, in recent decades. The uh, pollinators, the external pollinators, is not the, uh, uh, the exclusive domain of insects. There are other pollen external pollinators as well. And here I just list a, a few examples. Of course, the avian pollinators includes the hummingbirds, the sunbirds of East Africa, of, of Africa and the honey creepers in uh, Australia and, and uh, Oceania. Uh, mammals, uh, the possums and the flying foxes are critically important for the hardwoods in the in tropical forests the, uh, because they are highly, you know, they're primarily responsible for many of the hardwood uh, uh, pollination that is taking place. Um, but by far the greatest number of pollinators, of course, fall into the domain of the insects. And this coincided with 90 to 95 million years ago when the precursors of today's bees and pollinators, we collectively call them then bees, uh, they used to be wasp-like and carnivorous. And here you have a good example of a typical wasp uh, holding its prey and a fly and uh, is consuming the fly. Uh, then through millions of years, uh, there was a steady shift and a slow change in uh, the way how these insects started to uh, visit these flowering plants and were rewarded with a, f with a food. And uh, that is why the plants started to develop uh, a much more nutritious pollen uh, that would be then uh, a substitute to an uh, insect prey. Instead, the precursors to the pollinators started to develop and dietary requirements where pollen would be meeting all their needs for, uh, for amino acids, for protein, and the fuel in the tank, the energy source, would come from nectar, um, and that is basically a carbohydrate source. And so the plants started to develop special flower shapes, and the insects started to modify their body shape in order to fit the, into these flowers very effectively. They also develop certain body parts to take in the nectar uh, and to reach out to the deep-seated uh, nectaries in the flower. And the pollen grains could be carried through a pubescence, through hairiness, and the corbicula. The corbicula are these special uh, gaskets that, that uh, um, bees have developed, uh, some bees have developed on their legs. 
And again, high interdependency and, and symbiotic relationship between these very different organisms. And I, I would like to show you here a few of these examples. Uh, there are quite a few flowers <clears throat> that develop shapes that are uniquely adapted to accommodate a particular insect. And uh, in, uh, this is in, uh, a slipper uh, orchid in, uh, from England, uh, threatened with extinction as a result of its principal pollinator that has disappeared from the uh, British Isles uh, landscape. And they are now trying to reintroduce this. It is not this particular bee that you see here on the right side, uh, but just in general, the shape of these insects uh, are specific to quite often accommodate certain uh, flowers. In the tropics in South America, there is a particular orchid that can only be pollinated by a male of a particular uh, uh, orchid bee. <laughs> appropriately called. And this, uh, uh, in fact, is so sophisticated that the orchid is releasing a scent that causes the male uh, bee to believe that there is a female bee out there uh, that needs to be mated with. And so he crawls into this orchid and co copulates with this orchid. Um, uh, and, uh, and while doing that, uh, the orchid has a spring mechanism and puts a dab of pollen on its back. Uh, it then releases the bee, uh, the male bee, and the male bee is happily going to another orchid where he believes uh, a female is hiding. And eventually some of them will never find an orchid and others will actually, after a couple of trips to various orchids, do find an, an, a genuine female bee to mate with. Um, and this high level of interdependency illustrates that if you would take that bee away, that this orchid has no means of reproduction and vice versa, because this is the only floral source that this particular bee species visits. Another adaptation is the proboscis, and here you have a, honey, an, a bumblebee with an extraordinary long specialized mouth part. It is a tongue, essentially, and it is tubular in its shape, although it's not a true tube, but there are various parts that form a tube, and in this way it can reach into these uh, flowers, such as here the foxglove and, and the lupins, where uh, it can grab this flower and force its head in and reach the very deep uh, seated uh, nectaries at the bottom. And by doing that, it walks over or it hits the, uh, the pollen, the stamens, and it picks up a whole bunch of pollen. Keep in mind that the hairiness or the pubescence is an important part of the whole formula because when that bee is visiting a flower or before it hits the flower, uh, the wings are going through the air very rapidly and its body will generate static electricity. And that is particularly useful uh, in picking up uh, loose grains of pollen. Bumblebees have evolved in the bog environments of the temperate zones in uh, throughout the northern hemisphere. And often the, uh, the principal uh, uh, floral sources are, include things such as blueberries and cranberries and those um, in their natural habitat. And all of those have very sticky uh, and very moist pollen, and that is very difficult to dislodge. So bumblebees have developed this particular behavior called uh, the buzzing uh, pollination, where it grabs the flower and it, uh, it buzzes very rapidly by contracting and relaxing its flight muscles without moving its wing, wings. So the result is that the whole body vibrates and it dislodges all this pollen and it can then uh, get it stuck onto its hairs and it moves from there to the next flower. It's a very effective mechanism. Another uh, uh, methodology that some more primitive bees have is that they collect pollen in on their ventral side, on their belly side, and here you have of the abdomen, and here you have one of these helictids where you have uh, a beautiful amount of stiff hairs that are suitable for collecting pollen. And again, the pollen the bee needs, of course, for feeding to its young. So this is a substitute to uh, to uh, insect prey, these bees have all become totally vegetarian, if you will, and uh, they get all their amino acids uh, necessary for the production of proteins uh, from uh, the pollen grains that they collect. 
What is also important, and a lot of people don't think about this, is what they call this foraging fidelity. And that means that a bee does not go just from, let's say, a dandy, dandelion to a blueberry and from a blueberry to an apple or something like this. No, it doesn't do that. What it does is if it, if it starts today with flying on, let's say, dandelion, it will go from dandelion to dandelion and essentially ignores the other floral sources. And it is shifting to other floral sources only when the value of food is higher, the nutritional value is higher, or there is a change in the relative availability of one floral source over another. So blueberries I mentioned. So we often have the beekeepers putting their colonies into blueberries, not right at the time when the blueberries start to flower because the bees are still flying on the dandelion. But then the dandelion is starting to come to its end and then the bees are being kept or placed into the, the blueberries so that immediately they will start flying on the blueberries. Because if you put them in too early, they will keep on flying on the dandelions and they will ignore the blackberries or the blueberries. Okay. So, so floral uh, foraging fidelity is a very key behavioral uh, adaptation that pollinators have acquired over millions of years. Why is it so, so important? Well, uh, we are right in the midst of blueberry season. And here you have a good example of what the producer, what the grower would like to see. Uh, this is a high level of consistency of floral size. Uh, it has uh, high sugar content if they are well pollinated. Um, fruit uniformity, all of these flower, all these fruits are the same size. And of course, every grower likes to be the first kid on the block with fresh blueberries so that he can or she can uh, charge the highest price. Okay. If you don't do that, then you have typically these fruit sets where you have small little flowers and large, uh, large fruits and everything in between. And some of them have a high sugar content and another low content, uh, sugar content. And those ones are generally good for the, for the juice, for fruit juice market rather than for the fresh uh, market. Sorry, I, I have this slow uh, presentation of these of the text and I apologize for that. It is so important if you consider that it is estimated that one third of our diet of our own food is, is insect pollination dependent because we have acquired a taste for nice fruits and things like that that are uh, uh, insect pollination dependent. And if you look at the value of it in British Columbia, just the blueberry industry itself is worth between four and $500 million annually. Much of it is exported, um, and that is just blueberries. Uh, we have still in the Okanagan, of course, all the, the, uh, the tree fruits uh, from peaches and apricots to pears and apples and you name what, all of those have to be pollinated by bees not just honeybees, but just bees in general, insect pollinators. In Canada, the total value is estimate of agricultural production that is reliant on insect pollination is estimated to be over 1.8 billion. And in the United States, because of their warmer climates, not because they are better growers, but just simply because of warmer climates, they grow more grow uh, crops that are insect pollination dependent. And that is well over $20 billion. By the way, the most valuable cash crop and agricultural crop in California are almonds. And almonds cannot do anything unless the bees are brought in by the hundreds of thousands of hives every January and pollination is taking place in February. Okay. No bees, no almonds. So next time you are on your business flight, to uh, Toronto or something, and you get your complimentary little bag of uh, honey roasted, no less, almonds in a complimentary little package. Think about the bees that did the business at first. Okay. Worldwide, there's over, well over $200 billion worth of agricultural production that is dependent on insect pollinators. And here's a good example of some of the pollinators that we, uh, that we use for, uh, for the various crops. Um, and coffee, we may not eat the coffee beans itself, but coffee in the tropics are very dependent on insect pollinators as well. Um, and you see on the right side a variety of things. Cotton, sure, we don't eat cotton, but we certainly use the product. 
Um, and uh, of course, it is very important when we have seed crops such as canola and alfalfa and all these crops are all an integral part of the entire package of what we call modern agriculture. So we have, in addition to agriculture, uh, we of course have also a high level of environmental dependency on these pollinators. And what I was trying to say earlier is the greater the diversity of the pollinator fauna, the greater you have a sustainable reproductive habitat. We can call that basically a healthy environment. Uh, and because of the greater floral diversity, you end up as a consequence of that, also in greater biodiversity in all aspects, from little other insect species to birds and to all kinds of other things and wildlife that are ultimately dependent on the diversity that exists in any habitat. And of course, part of this whole presentation has to do is the ominous signs that we have been hearing about about the possible pollinator declines that have been taking place and uh, what is so important in this i like to equate the whole business about pollinators to that of a hot rod vehicle you may have in your garage and some hot rod car that has 500 horsepower of uh, uh, engine uh, that could do fantastic things. But in order to make that work, you need a set of spark plugs. Without the spark plugs, the 500 horsepower are never going to be realized. So you could say that the bees are the equivalency of spark plugs. Without the spark plugs, agriculture or the environment is not going to function very well. So that is why we would call pollinators the indicator species in many habitats. You remove them and we are in trouble. Okay, there is then an, it is a statement of the environment being under stress and it becomes then unsustainable in the long term. And it is important to recognize that there are two components to the declines. We have a quantitative decline, meaning a relative uh, abundance of pollinators in any habitat that could be going down or up. And that is very typical to a lot of native pollinators like bumblebees and a variety of these solitary bees, where you have some years where there is a great abundance of pollinators, or let's say a great abundance of bumblebees, followed by a few years of virtual disappearance. And you start to think from, my God, we are going to go down the drain. But that is the cycles are quite normal and they have always been around and they are caused by various environmental factors. But there is definitely a concern if you have a persistent decline in the abundance of pollinators. Now, separate to that, which is actually far more of a concern, has to do with the qualitative decline. And that means that if you have an environment in which in a habitat where they're used to have, let's say, 10 different species of pollinators that because of alterations and all kinds of other uh, factors, uh, they are now, let's say, only one or two species left. Now, that is a concern, particularly in areas where there is a lot of agriculture. Okay. And that is symptomatic and has been observed in many parts of the world where there is a lot of human activity and where there is a lot of uh, 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 agriculture going on. And that signals an element of unsustainability. And that is what we are talking about today or in, the, in today's terms. Uh, the pollinator declines, uh, there are a number of causes. And here I have just a nice short list of them. Of course, monocultural agricultural practices. Okay. I do work for the Ministry of Agriculture, but I am not ashamed to admit that modern agriculture is essentially a drive towards reduced biodiversity. And I will refer to that a little bit later. Farm chemicals, because if you have uh, reduced biodiversity, you end up relying more heavily on farm chemicals. And we have, of course, widespread destruction of undisturbed habitat. Uh, there is also this tendency towards habitat fragmentation, uh, because we like to have drive on highways, and we like to be par very parking lots, we like to have big malls, all these kind of things are uh, playing havoc with a habitat that used to harbor populations of pollinators and many other small creatures. 
We also have land, landscape alteration, and I will refer to that in a second. Persistent use of pesticides. And, and again, I'm not lambasting the agricultural industry at all, because uh, it, it should be noted that we have enjoyed since uh, the Second World War and, 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 and a flood of wonderful high quality products, food products at the lowest possible price. I mean, we here in North America spend less on our disposable income on food than just about anybody in the world. And yet it is of very high quality and standard. Okay? You go to some countries in the world where these standards are simply not met. And that is largely because they have much more uh, uh, problem with controlling pests or diseases such as molds or fungi or, or grasshoppers or you name it. Okay, so there is, an, there is an, a good side to modern agriculture. Don't, don't read me wrong here. However, there has been an overusage of many of these pesticides. Many of the farm chemicals today are used often prophylactically. And I like to often ask questions to people by saying, oh, by the way, are you taking any antibiotics just in case to prevent a bladder infection in the future? Now, people look at you and say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, this is what happens in a lot of cases of pesticide use. A few years ago, some of you may have heard about the neonicotinoids. The neonicotinoids are marvelous products because they are very effective in what they were designed to do, and that is to kill insects. But it has become a habit until recently that when you are a corn farmer and you want to have 10 tons of corn seed delivered to your farm gate uh, next spring, uh, it will be delivered. But you say, oh, oh by the way, uh, to the supplier, I don't want to have it coated with neonicotinoids. Oh, but that will be a special order because everything is nowadays with neonicotinoids. So as a result, you would have to pay more for a shipment of 10 tons without the neonicotinoid coating. Now, this policy has changed, I admit, but the point I'm trying to get at is, is that there has often been a kind of an, a laxy-daisy, easy-go way approach to using pesticides of all kinds. And this is worrisome because we seem to accord ourselves the luxury of being irresponsible for the use of many of these chemicals. And it is folly to think that merely by applying a pesticide that it will just do what it is designed to do without taking, killing the, the pest involved, without taking into consideration the environmental impact that some of these products can, uh, can have on the local habitat. And it is a big concern. In other words, we have to become more responsible. I'm not here anti-pesticides, don't read me wrong but we have to be far more responsible than what we have often been. And this picture, by the way, is a picture that came out of the 1960s or 70s or something. And at that time, we collectively looked at this and said, oh boy, this is a sign of progress. Look at this, all these soya beans from the foreground all the way up to the horizon, one crop. But in order to keep that crop going and free of pests, well, you have a biplane to deliver the pesticide. At that time, we were thinking differently. Nowadays, many of you, I'm sure, will have a set of lenses and think, oh, my, this is not particularly what I want. Because we have to start to recognize that there are downsides to our exuberant use of these, um, of these products. Another thing, we have no problems with habitat fragmentation. We cut here, there, and all over, and we leave small islands behind. This does not foster biodiversity. And this is an, a, a bit of a, of, a, of a, not an entirely uh, uh, correct example, but it illustrates and symbolizes, you know, here you have a little patch that is preserved for whatever reason. I don't know why they did it the way they did. Uh, but uh, let's say that there are some insects or some small uh, life forms in there, and they are now, this is now their world. And so they will become isolated from the rest of their world that they used to occupy. So this population may make us feel very good for having a beautiful park somewhere uh, and, and, and have that preserved. And we think we're all environmentally friendly and, and responsible. But in reality, many of these populations may well in the long term 
become unsustainable because there is simply not enough diversity in their genetic pool. So habitat fragmentation is a problem worldwide. Um, next one. I don't know why this. Uh, so the alteration, you have to consider that since the Second World War, we had an enormous change in the landscape. And uh, therefore, much of the undisturbed habitats started to disappear. I don't want to sound totally depressing, but it is worrisome. When the first pioneers came to the prairies to start cultivating the prairies, the average depth of soil on the prairies was about a meter, about three feet. To date, it's less than a foot. So this is in a span of about 150 years. This is a worrisome trend. I would hate to speculate what is going to be there in another 150 years. We also have a societal attitude that says, hey, if it has no economic value, no dollar value, well, we might as well remove it, destroy it, burn it, do whatever we do with it. It is, quote, worthless. Well, the reality of that is, is that you have in, in the prairie landscape, for example, the destruction of the traditional marshes uh, that were just filled in and plowed over and everything was now grain. But the result of that is that the landscape had altered enormously. In northern British Columbia, much of the original tree cover uh, consisted of poplar. And this deciduous tree permitted, because it is light shade rather than dark shaded, a uh, uh, fairly heavy forest floor cover that in itself facilitated a great variety of insect and small creatures. But after it was plowed over or cut down, guess what happens? The forestry companies are putting their, their favorite species of plants, and most of those were evergreens. And the same drama exists in Scotland, where uh, finally they get rid of a lot of these, these hills uh, uh, for hunting preserves, and now they put in forestry, uh, uh, tree, uh, forest trees. But most of those are Sitka. And if you look into a Sitka stand, there is absolutely nothing on the forest floor. So we, we re-engineer a lot of the landscapes with all very significant uh, environmental consequences. And of course, I don't have to say too much about the tropical rainforest with the endless plantations of, uh, of uh, palm uh, uh, plantations and things like this. And I was already referring to the British Isles landscape alteration. So we, we, we face some serious issues here that uh, we cannot ignore. This is a good example of landscape alteration in other in Alberta. This is what there was right after the Second World War in the top right, left corner. And then about, what, uh, 15, 20 years later, we start to see the first inroads in the, the, in, in the Peace River. And you go down to the left, uh, right, uh, to the left out there at the bottom, and you see there that a few years after that, it started to get, you know, less forested. And here we have a 1991. I don't even have an updated version in 2020, but uh, I can only imagine that it has not improved anymore, that there has been more alteration of the landscape. Now, in fairness, in fairness, much of the Peace River, they cultivate crops out there uh, that facilitate a lot of bees. And so there is plenty of reason that the total uh, uh, pollinator uh, uh, fauna has actually increased and have become more diverse. So I'm not suggesting that all the alterations are necessarily always wrong, but they do have a huge impact. So what do we do? Well, there has to be, in my view, a critical component. That's why I so, find it so encouraging to hear that the Agricultural Advisory Committee here in Maple Ridge offers this an educational thing. I think that there has to be, on a society level, a much greater emphasis placed on, on mandatory courses in, in biology, ecology, and environmental studies. If we collectively as a society expect our polit political masters in the future to make wise and good decisions on land use and public policy, surely we should have them well informed. And I think that it, it deserves for the collective good to be better educated about 
you know all these things related to the environment and to uh, and to uh, uh, to biology and the way how these things all work i mean to to put it to the extreme which is a bit of a nonsense thing but to the extreme we should learn more than just thinking that milk comes from savory you know there is a whole process behind it we also have to have an attitudinal change uh, we should uh, oh 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 i'm sorry i uh, go too fast Undisturbed habitats must must be recognized of having an intrinsic value beyond dollar interests. And arable land should have a high level of protection. Here in the Fraser Valley in particular, all of you know that, uh, uh, you know, every time again, there is uh, continuous pressure for getting agricultural lands out of the, out of the protection of the ALR or uh, an alteration in the use of, of, of the land, mostly ending up for development purposes. Okay? We must insist on having far greater protection on the most arable and the most productive lands that we have in the province found right here in the Fraser Valley. And then, of course, public policy changes. We have to put far more emphasis on restoration of natural habitats and uh, recognize them for their intrinsic value and legal protection so that it is not something that is temporarily uh, offering protection, but two years down the road or 10 years down the road, it is uh, falling to, uh, to, uh, to development anyway. What to do on a personal level? Well, a lot of people like to take our beekeeping courses and want to keep bees and do all these things. I don't necessarily recommend that at all. What I recommend if everybody wants to put in their share of support is plant more plants. That is to say, plant more bee friendly plants. And that is remarkably effective and not just effective, it's actually quite beautiful because these flowers can bloom and flower from early in the spring all the way to the fall season if you have a nice diversity in your own garden. And after a couple of years, you will see that there is going to be a plethora of all kinds of bees that are going to be taking advantage of, of the, the dinner table that you have offered them. And of course, get rid of the convenience driven uh, uh, practice of buying some chemical to remove a dandelion or whatever. You know what, you can also hand pick them, pull them out or mow it repeatedly. Many of these things are not necessary in the urban landscape. And of course, uh, promote green initiatives. That is equally important. And if all of us can do a little bit like this, uh, we will make a better world for ourselves and for our children. So I think that this is the last of my, yeah, I always finish with a lovely, sweet picture of a lovely bee. So this is it. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. That was awesome. Um, anybody that has any questions, if you want to come off mute, um, we'll gladly take some questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, we've got one in the, oh, that's a comment in the chat that, uh, um, it was very good, which of course we don't. Um, I have a couple of questions for you, for you, Paul, because um, we had a presentation at the AAC actually last year from from uh, the Bee Club and some people that wanted Maple Ridge to become a bee city. Um, I think that's that's a, uh, a highly uh, common occurrence nowadays. There's lots of bee cities registered in Canada. Uh, but I, I liked some of your your last comments there about it's not all about the honeybee, and I guess uh, I'm just wondering if you can comment on the importance of the other pollinators um, in the in the lower mainland here in the landscape. I don't even know how many pollinators there are. Maybe you can comment on that too. How many different species there are, but the value of the other pollinators and not just the value of honeybees. Oh, uh, if, if you don't mind, I like to expand it far, far beyond just merely the Fraser Valley, uh, because we have so many, uh, you know, it's so climate specific. But I, uh, a couple of things to refer to the importance of a greater diversity of the pollinator fauna. Studies have shown that if you have a plot of land of a certain size and uh, that is pollinated by, let's say, one or two species, you have a certain agricultural production that you can get out of that 
piece of land. If, however, uh, the same number of pollinators there are, but you can increase the diversity of them so that you that crop that from which you want to get production uh, is pollinated by a greater diversity of pollinators, let's say honeybees and bumblebees and osmia bees or mining bees or halictids or you name it, that your production goes up. And so quite a few years ago, I was invited to do a study with, for the blueberry growers in the, in the Fraser Valley, and uh, they wanted to enhance the bumblebee populations in near and in their plantings. And we came to the very simple discovery that the problem that uh, a lot of the bumblebees faced was that they ran out of fuel, ran out of food after the flowering of, uh, of the blueberry crop. And then they were basically falling into despair. They, they, they often went hungry or even starved to death. And therefore that nest was never able to fully reproduce. So we can do little steps for example, planting along hedge rows and, and edges of the fields and supporting riparian zones where there is greater biodiversity, where there is a greater diversity of food sources for these wild pollinators to exist. And that enriches the entire environment. And for the growers, it is a very effective way of increasing their total productivity. In Northern British Columbia and going all the way up into the Northwest Territories in the Yukon, honeybees can no longer exist out there. Yeah, you can, you can manage them for the summer, but the length of winter is so long that it is very difficult for them to be confined to the hive for eight or nine months. But the pollinators that exist out there are bumblebees. And these bumblebees thrive quite well because they have only annual or seasonal uh, activity and they don't have a nest for the winter so they don't have to store up food to sustain them in the winter season so many of these habitats are enriched with uh, a diversity of pollinators and last comment uh, actually southern okanagan is the richest habitat uh, with the greatest diversity of pollinators in all of Canada, with a reported number of some 450 different species of bees, out of a total in Canada of about 650 species of bees. In North America, we have about 3,300 to 3,500 species of bees. Wow, that's amazing. Sorry, that was a long answer for a short question. No, that's okay. That's Sorry. okay. No, I, I think it's important. Um, um, I'm involved with the Maple Ridge uh, Environment Committee as well, and one of the things we talk about is the importance of biodiversity in, in our urban areas uh, for pollinators and for general health and wellness and everything else, because a lot of the Fraser Valley is monoculture, like you talked about. And so in a lot of cases, we're finding the urban areas are often more biodiverse than, than some of our outlying Very areas. So, Very yeah. true. Yes. Um, do we have any questions from anybody else? I have, a, I have a question for you, Paul. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Um, can you comment on on wasps and how they kind of get a bad rap? Yeah, it, are, do they act as a as a good source for 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 pollinating plants, or are they are they more of a hindrance to the bee population? No, uh, wasps are of course uh, very closely related to the pollinators to the bees. Uh, and, and, and they have a common ancestry, is what I pointed out earlier. Uh, most wasps are basically, I mean, we are mostly thinking when we talk about wasps, most people think about yellow jackets or bald faced hornets. Okay, bald faced hornets less so because they like to live close to us because we always set the dinner table for them uh, in terms of our garbage and all stuff, but they tend to prefer to nest in dense vegetation that are the yellow jackets that probably have the worst reputation because they think that our homes and our man-made structures are perfect for their nests. So they live the closest to us and they also have a tendency to invite themselves uh, for your barbecue event in the summertime. And that is a real nuisance. Uh, but you should consider that wasps as an entirety is an immensely diverse group of insects and most of those, or virtually all of them, with a few exceptions, have zero interest in us or in our food. And the vast majority of these wasps are solitary insects. They are not social. So they live on their own. 
And the ones that you only worry about, I suppose, uh, are, are those that can sting. But the vast majority of wasps cannot sting. They may have a stinger, but the stinger is used. It's, it's not a stinger. It is an ovipositor, and it is used to lay eggs. So the vast majority of wasps in this world do one thing, and that is they are insect hunters. They eat other insects. And uh, I hope that everybody can remember and recognize that without wasps, we would have an ecological collapse, because then very few but many numerous populations of insects will obliterate the world. I mean, it will be a massive problem. So they are you might see the proverbial lions of the Serengeti. They have to keep these, these the other insects in, in under control. And, and the diversity is remarkable. It's, it's, uh, there are some wasps that do nothing else but eat one or hunt one particular uh, uh, species of insect. All of you are perhaps familiar with the mud dauber. The mud dauber is this dangly, long-legged character, a fairly large wasp with a very narrow ab uh, 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 waist and then with a bulbous abdomen at the end. And it hardly flies. I mean, it is a kind of almost like an, a crane fly, so, so uncoordinated as it flies. Well, don't be fooled because the mud dauber produces out of mud a set of pipes or, or tubes that are vertically placed against the wall somewhere in a protected location. And after it has been constructing this, it will get, go back into the blackberry bushes and is searching for spiders. And it will sting that spider and the spider is not killed, it is paralyzed. And it will shove a whole bunch of these spiders, paralyzed spiders in the tubes and then guess what happens? At the end, when the tube is full, it will lay a bunch of eggs, and those eggs will hatch, and those extremely hungry larvae of the mud dauber will have a fresh meat supply. Uh, I'm not against spiders, but I'm only illustrating that this is the way how it works. And uh, uh, wasps are a critical component to the health of our environment. Sorry, more detail than you anticipated to no, hear. Good, good, thank you. <laughs> I think you're right though, Paul, in, in the world of uh, horticulture, especially floriculture and uh, probably even greenhouse veggie, uh, we buy wasps to take care of uh, insects that we don't want within the greenhouses. So it's, it's quite amazing. And Carcia Formosa. Yeah. You're familiar with that. What a beautiful name. Yeah. You know, from, an, from a wasp that you can barely see, so small as it is, but it's a specialist on one thing, and that is white flies. Very effective, biocontrol. Yeah. 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 I have a question as well, quickly. Just, uh, just building on on your answer to Bill's question there, um, is it possible, you know, with with edge management, head rows, and riparian management to sort of support greater biodiversity? Could you could you replace um, the need to bring in pollinators in an agricultural landscape or would you still, would, would it ever be enough to just no. attract? No. 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 And the reason is simple. Uh, it is a numbers game. Even though, the, for example, the bumblebee is far more effective, far more uh, efficient in pollinating blueberries. Okay. But uh, uh, because it co-evolved over millions of years to be particularly effective in that. The number games are, are problematic. We discovered or we determined that uh, an acre of high bush blueberry, of full grown uh, high bush blueberry, generate or produce approximately four and a half to five million flowers. Studies has also shown that you have multiple, it requires multiple visitations. In other words, each flower must be visited at least more than once in order to ensure full seed set. Uh, I don't want to go into too much of the biology of the blueberries and, and the number of seeds that are involved, but basically it needs multiple visitation. So if you have over a span of four to four and a half uh, or for four weeks or something uh, to pollinate per acre, four and a half million flowers, that is a huge task. Now, the problem is that this early flowering crop, and it is mostly happening in April, May, uh, the, uh, the the the, uh, the the bumblebee populations that may exist are small, and maybe a population by that time may 
if we are kind of optimistic, may have 50 individuals. And let's say that out of these 50 individuals, half the population, which is doubtful, but let's say half of the population would feel compelled to pollinate or to forage. So you have now 25 of those bumblebees flying around. If you put in at the same time for a fee, you put in a honeybee colony, and at that time you could expect a population in a honeybee colony of about 12,000 bees. And of course, honeybees are fair weather flyers. They are picky because they evolved in a more warmer climate of the Mediterranean and those areas. So they are picky. The girls just don't want to come out when it is a little bit cool or it is rainy or whatever. And let's say that only 10% of the population of the honeybee colony will come out. Well, if you have 12,000 of these bees, then still 1,200 foraging bees are out there. And that is just from one colony. And we recommend approximately two colonies, honeybee colonies per acre for a commercial setting. So basically you cannot really expect a natural resource of natural pollinators to be sufficient for meeting a monocultural practice of rows and rows of nothing but one particular crop. It, it just, that the numbers just don't mm -hmm. add. But you're saying they can, they can increase production. So they, oh, they can't do by so. themselves, but they can sort of catch those, you know, flowers that the honeybees aren't catching and Correct. kind of. Correct. Right. So they're highly complementary to the entire production process. Very right. true. Okay, interesting. And that studies have shown this. I mean, it's not that I just uh, cooked that up. It's uh, it's it has been well proven. Yeah. Yeah. And and how mobile are these in the landscape? Like a like a um, a native pollinator? Are they are they yeah. sticking to a particular field, or, or how far are they traveling? Good point. Uh, all those pollinators, uh, are, by and large, the wild pollinators are essentially short distance flyers. And the reason is simple. Uh, the, the, uh, the most sophisticated of the wild pollinators are the bumblebees. Ones that are less evolved in evolutionary terms are typically your solitary bees, like the mason bee, the blue orchard mason bee, and alfalfa leaf cutter bee, and some of those. Uh, uh, they do not communicate with each other at all. They, they are gregarious, meaning that the females all like to nest close together, but that is not for the completion of their brood development or for their reproductive purposes. It is primarily to reduce predatory pressure and to enhance the chances of crossbreeding, okay, during mating mm -hmm. season. But if you deal with the, the most sophisticated of the wild pollinators, then you talk about the bumblebees in our environment. The problem is with the bumblebee nest is that these girls, or sorry, they're all female. So the, these bees do not really talk to each other in an insect form. Honeybees do. So honeybees uh, are long distance flyers. And the reason for that is, is that they communicate with each other inside the nest, inside of the hive, to tell each other through a dance and through a variety of means and an exchange of pheromones and things of this, where a food source has been found. So when honeybees go out of the nest, out of the hive, they don't just wander all over the place. They are being told ahead of time, look, you go into this and this direction and you fly two kilometers and that is where the food source is. So they are very directed foraging activity. Bumblebees, on the other hand, do not communicate with each other that way. And so they just wander out and they say from, geez, yesterday I was out here and I think I found a food source somewhere out there. And because they don't really know very well where the food sources are, they are confined to a much smaller foraging range. It explains, therefore, that the wild pollinators, even in their nests, will never be able to access the food sources from such a larger distance as what honeybees do. And therefore, at the end of the year, you have a total nest biomass of wild pollinators that is far uh, uh, less than what honeybees can do. Honeybees are masters in uh, gauging the environment and know where food sources are. And therefore, they can 
collect so much more and therefore they have much larger populations as a result. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you. Amazing, actually. Yeah. Okay, well, we're right at the hour since we started, uh, so we should probably wrap it up. Um, Adam, is there an email address for the Ag Advisory Committee? I think there is, but I don't remember what it is offhand. Um, I don't know if you want to provide that uh, quickly or yeah, uh, if they can just visit the website and find it. Yeah, I think that probably the best thing is I'll just put my email address in there and that's uh, that's the quickest and easiest way to get a hold of me. So I'll just put okay. that in now. Uh, before we do leave, Paul, thank you very much for the presentation. Yes. It was very informative. You're most welcome. Appreciate it. You're most welcome. And by the way, if anyone has particular problems, uh, not problems, but questions about bees or pollinators afterwards, uh, or any of your audience later, uh, all what they have to do is BC Apiculture, uh, uh, Google that, and you will get into the government web page that deals with bees. And then somewhere my name is out there that uh, you can email me and uh, or any of my staff, and then we can go from there. Perfect. So the other thing in leaving is we're also looking for suggestions or comments for uh, future topics. Uh, this was a great one, a great kickoff. Um, I don't know a more knowledgeable person than Paul on, on the subject. Um, so it's been, it's been really, really good. So thank you, Paul. Um, awesome. We will get the, the word out there so that uh, the presentation will be available and be shared. And I'm sure other people will find it valuable as well. So okay. anyway, terrific. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.